think it was Alex Alexander who works at um, Linux saw my impressive title, Global Research of Research VP for Strategic Architecture, and he probably thought I was important. And he called me up and he said, um, Andre is going to be in Boston in, in a couple of weeks, and can we bring you in for a briefing on, on our product? So I thought, why not? That's, uh, that sounds good. And uh, I want to report I was impressed with the, with the briefing. I probably spent two hours in uh, Alex, Andre's office talking about a lot of stuff. I think, I hope I asked some tough questions. He took notes. I don't think it was his shopping list. Um, and, and then at the end, I said, oh, oh, and by the way, that poster you have that says best practices for business capabilities, those aren't really the best practices. And, uh, and he was concerned and he said, well, what are the best practices? Why do you know what they are? We had a little conversation and he invited me to come and talk about them and hopefully we'll, we'll update that, that poster as well. So um, since then, by the way, I have retired from IDC and gone back to being an independent consultant. So now I'm, I'm an adjunct analyst, like an adjunct professor. I do just as much work, but I don't get paid as well. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about what's the Business Architecture Guild, capabilities, best practices. I have 30 minutes, 10 practices, plus or minus some stuff. So two, two minutes each, it's going to be fast. OK. Uh, the Business Architecture Guild was founded in 2010 uh, by myself and five colleagues because business architecture was starting to become more recognized as, as a practice, as an architectural practice. And what we wanted to do was collect best practices around it and, and get some cohesion around those best practices and create an organization where uh, business architecture professionals could communicate and collaborate with each other. Um, so we created the Business Architecture Guild, created a, a definition, which we argued over for a couple of years, a blueprint of the enterprise that provides a common understanding of the organization and aligns strategy and tactics. Basically, that's what we think business architecture is. Um, it's a way to express your business intentions in some formal and structured and organized way. It's not to replace any of these other things, planning or business analysis or good judgment or management or IT architecture. It's to align with those things. And in order to do that, we created what's called the BizBoc, the business architecture body of knowledge. Uh, today, this is out at version 6.5. So we produce a new version every six months. Today, we have roughly 3,000 practicing business architects that are members of the Business Architecture Guild in, I think, 38 different countries around the world. Only 27% are from the US. Uh, we have 18, I believe now, 18 different collaborative teams who work on adding new content to the BizBoc. Every eight months, we roll out whatever's ready. Um, it's up to about 600 and some odd pages. Now there's a lot of stuff here. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of that. Just to say, um, we're always adding new stuff. We're always looking for new good ideas. It's a completely volunteer organization, so new good ideas mean you also wanna help deliver them. Um, so the foundations of business architecture are the ideas of capabilities, what a business does, value streams, how does the business interact with its partners and customers to exchange value between them, what information is involved in, in that exchange of value through those capabilities, and what's the organizational structure that delivers that. Those are the key components of business architecture. Um, so we call that the foundation. And then, and what we've discovered is that depending on which business architecture question you're trying to resolve, like how should I do this merger or acquisition, or what new product should I roll out, or how should, what should my digital transformation strategy be, then you'll need a different set of these uh, extended architecture elements. Like architecture, it's about concepts and relationships in a context. So these are the concepts and the relationships, but today we're gonna talk about capabilities. 
I just want to point out there's, there's 55 pages in the BizBoc of best practices on capabilities. I've done my best to narrow that down to 20 minutes and 10 practices. Uh, so I've done a little interpretation here. Um, so let's start with what's a capability. It's interesting that this definition, which we've been using, uh, an ability or capacity that a business possesses to exchange or exchanges to achieve a purpose or outcome, was developed in 2006 by a guy named Ulrich Holman. He's a distinguished engineer at IBM. Uh, and in 2006, what problems were we trying to solve? How to make sense of SOA. And so this was actually an approach to say, here's how we structure the business so that the, those business capabilities become the definition of our SOA uh, services. Um, anyhow, that, that was the, the crux or the genesis of capabilities. Um, so ecosystem management might be something that you would think about doing as, a, as part of your digital transformation strategy. A capability defines what the business does and not how. We're going to talk more about that because it's really important. But capabilities change, but not a lot over time. And especially the high level, level one capabilities change very infrequently. What does change often, though, is the, in the effectiveness and importance of those capabilities in your current business strategy and your strategic initiatives. Um, Capabilities are an abstract concept. Again, we're going to talk more about this. And then we have instances of capabilities. And an instance of capability is some combination of people, process, and technology. Not. It sort of is, except if you still think that's the, that's the paradigm of implementation, you're missing information. People, process, information, and technology. Right? Data is the new oil. Today's economy is based on information. If that's not part of your paradigm, if you've buried that in term, inside of process or technology, you're missing it. Um, and what we see is that when we have many instances of the same capability, there might be a good reason for that, but usually it's, it's um, technical debt and redundancy. So let's talk about the best practices. Capabilities are modular. They define what the business does. I'm going to do 90 seconds on each. Uh, nouns, not verbs. 25 word definition. They're object based, hierarchical, abstract. It, they're interesting alone, but they're better when they com we combine them with other things. Um, they're categorized and can be measured. And um, capability models stand on the shoulders of giants. So let's look at all of these. This is uh, something I put together when I was at IDC, uh, because IDC was pushing this idea, it's a good idea, of a digital business platform. And the digital business platform is a platform of capabilities that support digital transformation in new digital businesses. So we talk about capabilities being modular and reusable, plug and play, industrial, scalable, partitioned, not overlapping. So you could think about building up your digital transformation strategy from some set of capabilities. You might have a capability that does customer management, provides a 360 degree view. Maybe you have a capability that does social activity monitoring. Maybe you have some lower level capabilities that do recommendations and that do some kind of uh, analysis or AI. And you might want to combine all of those capabilities to support your service desk in one instance and to support your mobile shopping uh, app in another instance. Right? So it's important to define these things as modular, non-overlapping, non and uh, non-redundant. So here's an example of a typical capability map. Um, so some things like relationship management, channel management, procurement management um, that talk about what the business does. We'll get into that. Capabilities are self-contained concepts that are not procedural in nature and are typically built around some sort of an object. 
And often we will stratify a capability model in terms of these three strategies, strata, which would be strategic. So in the top are often capabilities that are important to your executive and leadership. In the middle, the value added or the core or the customer facing capabilities are the things that, that are the bread and butter of your operations, the things that give your operations efficiency and effectiveness, make you competitive. And at the bottom, things like HR and training and whatever, they're important, you can't have a business without them, but you probably could outsource them just as effectively. And so this strata allows you to look at those capabilities through a different lens. So every capability has a name, and it's important to come up with a good name for these capabilities. The names are nouns, not verbs. So customer management is a good name. Manage customer is a process. That's a bad name for capabilities. Um, we'll talk about the difference between capabilities and processes briefly, and I'll show you why that's important. The second thing is that every capability has a clear and concise definition. And this is really important, especially if you're trying to use that, that AI machine learning capability mapping uh, feature, that fantastic feature that we saw this morning. Luckily, there's a formula for naming capabilities. And, um, and so it goes, it's the ability to do this, this, and this on this kind of an object or information with this uh, goal in mind. So here's some examples. The ability to control, develop, review, analyze, and report on financial strategy for maintaining sufficient equitable levels of assets and liabilities in order to meet expense obligations and maintain sufficient cash flow. Now, it takes a little bit of time to come up with these really good definitions, but I'm going to say this is the most important thing you can do in capability modeling. Because when you actually state your capability with this level of clarity, that's when you find out what it really does. That's where you identify the redundancies, the gaps, and the overlaps. Um, if you are just creating this capability model for yourself, you could. That might be OK. But if you're going to try to share it with your business partners, you have to get them involved, right? So it has to be business definitions in business terms for business professionals where you engage the business professionals that have or use those capabilities in helping you come up with these definitions. Um, and if you don't do that, then you lose um, some credibility and a lot of value in creating the capability model or at least in terms of it being something that allows you to communicate with the business, which is obviously one of its goals. Uh, capabilities are object-based. So there are a lot of objects in business that we deal with. So customers, agreements, accounts, policies, claims, whatever. And so anything that's got a business object has some kind of a capability around managing that object. And typically at level one, we're going to have asset management, customer management, agreement management. Right? Then level two and three, we'll get into the details of that. Um, the idea of this object also provides us a focal point for understanding the relationship between capabilities and the hierarchy of them. I'll show you an example of that. Um, here's just an example, again, of one of the best practices pulled out of the biz, business architecture body of knowledge for understanding this relationship between um, customers and customer analytic, customer management, and, and what should be a level one or a level two capability. OK, so capabilities are hierarchical. So we have a level one, like procurement management. As part of that, we manage vendors and product acquisition. And as part of managing vendors, we manage their information and contracts. Right, so we break this down into uh, hierarchies. Typically, level three is where we usually go with capabilities. I've seen maps up to level six, sometimes level four or five. Um, but typically, what we're going to do is start level one, get some agreement with it, 
go down to level two in most of those areas um, and stop there. And then, as needed, as we start to map it against our IT portfolio or figure out which capabilities we need for our strategic initiative, or whatever, then we'll go down to the level three or level four as necessary. So we're not here just to create these maps for the purposes of creating the maps. We're here to create those maps to help influence decisions. And uh, Joe was up here before. It's nice to hear his discussion and talk about a, a lot of the same things I've experienced in my years as an architect. One of the things I always say is creating architecture delivers zero value. You only get value from architecture when you use it to influence decisions. So we need to understand what decisions we're trying to influence, who makes those decisions, and what kind of information we can give them, what architectural artifacts and information we can give them that will help them make better decisions. And if we create an architectural artifact and we don't know what decision we're trying to influence and who's going to use it, we're probably wasting our time. Uh, okay, so here's two rules that we use for segregating out capabilities. So we have the, the, these business objects of policy, customer claim, proceedings, and the question is, are they level one or level two? And so we would say customer management and policy management are two separate capabilities. Because we could have policies without customers. We can have customers without policies. OK, might not make a lot of sense, but we could. right? But, um, um, but we can't have processing without claims, for example. So claim might be a level one, and processing would be a level two. We have a different map called the exercisability test, um, where we might have a a, pro, a capability for search and a capability for doing something else. And we could see that search is something that would be more generic and useful across many capabilities or, or many other higher level capabilities. We might promote it to become a, a higher level, level one capability. So uh, I feel after this morning's presentation embarrassed by my graphics, but <laughs> this is one from Credit Suisse. So again, an example of the hierarchy of their capability model. This is you know, their actual capability model. Um, and what we see is that the level one capability is helpful in, at sort of the strategic level. So when we're asking strategic questions, then uh, level one capabilities are useful. And what that does is it provides us a common vocabulary, so a classification and taxonomy of the enterprise that helps us now go to the next level of detail where, where we're probably thinking about strategic prioritization and strategy to execution mapping and initiatives. Uh, so typically that's done at a level two model of capabilities. And then that provides some consistency and efficiency and synergy for the level three capabilities, which are then going to be the things that we implement in projects. So, uh, okay. Now, this is not my picture. This comes from Huawei, uh, so your mobile phone company. Um, and here's their picture of a capability. And they say it's some combination of technology, application, product, information, and people. Right? It has some other attributes. But a capability itself is an abstract concept, like an abstract class. It has instances or instantiations of this combination of things. Now, by defining the capability as a unique thing, what we typically discover is that there's four or five different instances, or maybe 17 in some cases, instances of the same capability using different technologies, different applications, different processes, different information, and owned by different organizations. If we just look at the applications, it's difficult to see this level of redundancy. Or if we just look at the processes, it's difficult to see this level of redundancy. When we look at the capabilities, it gives us visibility into the level of redundancy. There might be good reasons to have two instances of the same thing, might, but probably not to have six. Right. So capabilities become a really good method 
for merger and acquisition cleanup or for application portfolio cleanup because they make those redundancies visible. Okay. Uh, so better together. If you take your capability model and you walk up to your business partner with a big smile on your face, hey, look at this, isn't it cool? What's, what do you think they're gonna say to you? Well, that's exactly the reaction they're gonna have. Like, so what, you know? <laughs> what are you drinking? Or in case, in case of California, what are you smoking? Give me some. And uh, because, it's not the right thing to show to somebody. But what it is really useful for is understanding the relationships between things. So we can understand what capabilities are necessary in terms of our value interactions with customers. Or we can understand what capabilities require what information. And if we know that we're going to change this information, it's going to affect this capability, which is going to ripple into these different steps of this value stream. Or we know what organizations own or use which capabilities. Or um, how those capabilities support our business strategy. Or how those capabilities map to initiative planning or <laughs> how they map to uh, costs and performance or in the case, let's say, of Linux, how those capabilities map to our application portfolio. So it's the combination of the capability and its relationship to these other things that makes it really valuable. Um, measured. So here's an example of a heat mapped set of capabilities. Green obviously is good, yellows, eh, reds not so good, purple means we don't have it yet. Right? So we can, we can measure the capabilities across a wide variety of different metrics and come up with uh, different ways of looking at them. Here's a, an example of a, of a simple spreadsheet where we measure the capabilities based on the value they bring to the business the level of effort required to bring them up to snuff, the current functional level, and, and how they're performing. And to make it look real, you know, I left some of the things out because not everything's been measured yet, right? So we can come up with a picture of many different ways to look at the capabilities and look at them together and decide what. What we should be doing first, what we shouldn't be doing at all. You know, where should we be prioritizing? What's going to have the most synergy across our different, uh, across our different uh, business opportunities? Stand on the shoulder of giants. See, we're there. This is number 10, in case you had been counting. Uh, so we have a set of uh, industry reference models in the business architecture body of knowledge. Uh, so each of these models has been put together by a team of a dozen or in some cases 20 or 30 people who are experts, expert business architects and expert subject matter experts in these particular industries. And then they've worked over a fairly long period of time to create a reference model of value streams and capabilities, uh, each with that great 25 word definition and all of that. Um, so you know, here's an example of, again, the um, financial services reference model. These are all available in the business architecture body of knowledge. So how am I doing on time? Do I, am I done? Do I have two more minutes or five more minutes? Five. five. Okay. So, um, so this is a real example from a real client of mine, EDC, Export Development Bank of Canada. Um, and what they did was they had this mess, right? And here's their mapping of all these applications to, um, they were big into lean, so they did lean value streams, and they had their primary lean value stream, and, uh, and they mapped all of these applications in this big mess against that lean value stream, and then they drew this, you know, this arrow, the magic happens here arrow, right? And this is the beautiful picture that's going to merge when we, when we evolve that, right? And uh, then they even created you know, these beautiful roadmaps for how it would work, right? So what do you think happened? <laughs> so very correct, oops. Uh, so nothing happened here, and there was a bunch of reasons. 
Um, one is that this mapping of, of applications to business processes and uses was so confusing and so many to many that they couldn't make hide their hair of it. A second thing, and this is really important, is that people are emotionally attached to applications. And so arguing over which application is more or less important is arguing over which religion is better. Right? And we all know which one it is, but we don't agree on it. So, um, so what they actually did, so I, it, after a year and a half, it failed. You know, they had all these great roadmaps, nobody bought into it. So instead, they mapped their lean value stream to uh, some smaller value streams, and then for each one of these items to the specific set of capabilities that they needed. Now, everyone in the business was able to agree on on, th on this, 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 and this, and thus agree on that. And then they put a roadmap in place that said, here are the capabilities we need, and here's where we're going to get them. And then they were actually able to get rid of the applications that some people loved, but which weren't aligned, because people had agreed and committed to a decision that was independent of the applications. So we tricked them. Right? <laughs> So, I mean, it, it sounds silly, but it, it really is true because these capabilities are this sort of abstract concept, and if you agree to a roadmap on them, you've taken out the, the personal attachment that your 17 years of working on the same application had. So, um, anyone here been to Brussels? I know all of you guys have, right? So, Brussels is an interesting place because I think it was in, in 1896 or something like that, roughly then, there was a big, big fire in Brussels. And, and neighbor, whole neighborhoods were burned down. And then they started to rebuild around 1898 through uh, the next five or seven years, right at the time that the Art Nouveau revolution was at its peak. So you can take these tours of Brussels of all these fantastic Art Nouveau houses. So here's a typical kind of nothing house in Brussels. Now, in, in, at the time, the taxes were based on how wide the house was. So all the houses are like this skinny, long, and tall. All right, so here's kind of a nicer house. Same size, just nicer. Here's a, a lot nicer house. It's an extra story tall, you, you know, better detail, a lot nicer, and then this, is uh, I think this is where the crazy cat lady lives, or you know the the uh, they had been a little too much time in the coffee houses in Amsterdam, whatever. Um, so let's just ignore that one for a second. So this is kind of a crappy house in a crappy neighborhood where they have crappy cars and there's dirt on the street. And this is a pretty nice house in a nice neighborhood where they have okay cars and the streets are nice. And this is a fancy house in a fancy neighborhood where they have fancy cars and they hire people to walk their dogs, right? Now, it did not cost twice as much to build this house as that one, but that's how much it's worth today. It did not cost 3.5 times as much to build this house as that one, but that's how much it's worth today. And the reason is this, and this is the architectural point to this story. When you build something fantastic, fantastic things get built around it. When you build something pretty nice, pretty nice things get built around it. And when you build crap, the crap <laughs> accumulates around it. So as we build applications, you know, if we have a lot of money, let's build that, but let's at least build this so that the network and the ecosystem that we build and the partners that want to build the add-ons and the new spreadsheets and stuff for Linux want to be in this game and not in that one. 